hear a squawk on this episode of The Pine Talk. Ezra and Peter will share their stock of information to keep you up to date around the clock. Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of Pine Talk. The podcast for the Pine64 community by members of the Pine64 community. I am Peter, scrambling Linux phone app list maintainer at appl.ist. And I am Ezra, internet content creator and software philosopher. In this episode, we'll be discussing some Pine64 community news and general news. We will go over some answers to a question that we asked you, and then we're going to discuss some questions that you sent in. But first, what have we been up to lately? Well, I've been thinking about the future. I want to make more videos about software development, projects that I'm working on, maybe mix it up a bit with some storytelling. Of course, all available on my YouTube and Odyssey channel, Electronion, or my website, electronion.com. What about you, Peter? Well, um, I've been just not thinking about it. I've been making a video <laughs> <laughs> about Safer OS because Safer OS has seen a major release lately, uh, 4.0.1.48. Yeah, that's a mouthful. And that's working quite nicely, although there aren't images yet. And unfortunately, Selfish has this proprietary UI component, but it's been really smooth and it has many nice apps. And the default browser works now, which is quite important. Mm. So, yeah. Um, nice. Do you have questions about Selfish? <laughs> yeah. Um... Do you think they're the square root of pure evil since they use proprietary software? <laughs> <laughs> of course they are. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I uh, I think it's really unfortunate that they uh, uh, don't open source this. I think it's just one or two little things. Some really small components they're not open sourcing. And it does definitely... Um, doesn't help them with adoption by some circles of the community because otherwise they are really fairly close to standard Linux and even though they are now uh, doing some isolation via fire jail so on, which is not typical for your standard Linux distribution, but yeah it's it's unfortunate um, but I mean yeah, they've got this business strategy and apparently it seems to be worth the trade-off for them, so that's that. But it's really smooth, and um, maybe watch my video and give it a try, but make sure to read the description, because otherwise you will be frustrated and be like, well, I can't download that image. Well, you can't. You have to upgrade it manually, and that can take some time. At least it did for me. Mm -hmm. But I think we should get into the news now, right? We've got community news and well wider news and we try to uh somehow uh interweave that a bit so that makes it may, might make sense so first up we've got a story by linux smartphones.com and also the original blog article well not the original but the translation to english because the guy who did this is german but I think I should get to the point. So, yeah, video calls on the Pine phone. You can now sort of kind of do that on Matrix via the Element web app on Fedora on the Pine phone. So, it's been a per it's now possible to get that Pine phone camera working somewhere that's not megapixels and that's quite the achievement, I think. Mm -hmm. I would agree. It is very impressive. Very impressive. Yeah. And, well, the I think I've, I've got some problems with the setup uh, that um, Marius, so not our editor Marius, another Marius, describes here. Uh, because he 
is really going through it and installs that element client locally, at least in the German version of the blog post. He doesn't do it in the English one, so don't think that's necessary. Because what we need here, what's important about this setup is are the, the environmental variables that make sure that you've got uh, the camera exposed and um, the GPU acceleration working, and then that you have the right version of the kernel and the necessary packages installed. I try to achieve this or try to replicate this on Manjaro Plasma Mobile Unstable earlier today, and I didn't make it yet. So, yeah, I will have to keep tinkering with that, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely interesting. It's great to see initial video calling. So, because that's something many people ask for, and I really felt like it wouldn't be possible at all for some time. And, yeah, I mean, he reports, Marius reports, that he had some 400% CPU um Gosh. load so <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of potential for optimization <laughs> to yeah. put it bluntly but yeah <laughs> i think <laughs> we're getting there right one step at a time you ne it needs to be functional before yeah. it can be optimal that's true and now a story that isn't really a community story and do you guys now, MIPS. It's another one of those reduced instruction set computing architectures like ARM or PowerPC. And it was in introduced in 1985, so was I, and seemed to have a promising future in the 1990s. Maybe your root router runs on a MIPS CPU, or maybe you've heard of the Chinese Longson processors. Uh, Richard Stallman once used a laptop with such a CPU of the very affordable Ingenic JZ40-something <laughs> CPUs. Um, lately, MIPS have been bought and sold a few times. Imagination Technologies, who also make these power VR CPUs that don't have open drivers, <laughs> last sold MIPS to an AI startup called Wave Computing, who then went bankrupt last year. And now they've re-emerged as MIPS Technologies and are going to make Rumble, wait for it, Risk Five CPUs. And they've joined Risk Five International for that purpose. So looks like we've got one less CPU architecture going forward, but uh one potentially strong and helpful member uh, for Risk Five. I think that's really that's really interesting, and I think I'm feeling quite optimistic about <laughs> about that. Yeah, as yeah. as you said, like that could be a very a very powerful team. Uh, well, they they definitely should know how to design CPU cores, right? <laughs> so that's always helpful, and yeah, of course, less competition um, maybe detriment to the marketplace, but then. Yeah, MIPS really uh, hasn't been on everybody's mind lately, and so that's not the great loss. And it's assu assumed that they will continue licensing uh, the old architectures out. Mm -hmm. So not so much is going to change there. And we've linked a nice hacker news thread uh, for more, um, so that you can read some other people's opinion on that. Because there's some, you know, there's some more backstory. Like at one point, it was like MIPS is going to be open sourced, and well, that effort seems to be gone. But figure that out on your own. Unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. But an interesting story to be sure. A story that's dragged out my entire life. <laughs> yeah, and then we've got another piece of community news related to that and it's you know this little risk 5 boards that you can get in the pine 64 store the pine nut and the pine cone 
Well, those can be paired to a LoRaWAN transceiver. And uh, Loop Yuan Li wrote one of his articles about that. Connect Pinecone BL602 to LoRa transceiver. And I think that's definitely worth a look and read. Because, well, I've, I've seen quite some excitement about LoRaWAN and about RISC-V, and this is combining both. So, yeah, check that out, I think. Yeah, for sure. Agre agreed. <laughs> LoRaWAN. I mean, that's something we should maybe talk about for a bit. So, I've seen some excitement that seemed a bit uh, over the top. Um, because it felt like, oh, we're going to build uh, a new messaging in infrastructure on that and so on. And yeah, you can. But um, I'm quoting the Wikipedia here. Depending upon the spreading factor, it can achieve data rates between 0 0.3 and 27 kilobits per second. Uh, just for as a point of comparison, that good old dial-up modem that had fifty-six kilobits. So yes, text messaging I think is a possibility. Um, the article we just mentioned uh, goes into like sensors that monitor plants and light. I think is what you typically m measure with plants. Uh, that's possible to do about the uh, with this bandwidth, but you won't really uh, be able to share your fun memes or gifs, <laughs> right? <laughs> Indeed. Do you know though the distance that it can travel? Oh yeah, I I recall that it can go really far, like seven hundred something kilo kilometers. But I don't know whether they tested that in the Arizona desert where even Wi-Fi can go very far. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it it's really long range. The LoRa stands for long range. Yes. And that's true. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, like, as you said, you won't be sending your memes to anyone, but yeah, it definitely could be interesting if you wanted to perhaps create some kind of, um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, automation or, or, or such, since you mentioned the plants in the article. Yeah. It could be interesting to have a way to communicate to long range, and perhaps it could also be used for emergency equipment. Uh, if ever there is like a, a place that's susceptible to uh, natural disasters, to have a system built with LoRaWAN to enable yeah. communication. Although walkie-talkies also exist. Just saying. <laughs> Yeah, but but you know sensors for that that maybe uh, can measure mm. some earthquakes. Yeah, and then send this data to a central point mm -hmm. uh, that can live for long times of battery or solar power. Mm -hmm. That's definitely a field of application. Mm, for I, sure, I know for a fact that it's actually being used here in Munich f by some people for. Uh, Sense, sensing the air quality and uh, collecting data about that. So that's another use case. So if you want to know how dirty the air in your road is, um, people use LoRa for that to collect that data. Enjoyable. Yeah. But not really. I mean, maybe you can... Uh, convert your memes to uh, ASCII art <laughs> 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 and then send, send them over Laura. That would be the best uh, best thing you could do, I think. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. Because you'd have to severely like compress your image if you wanted to send it in any acceptable amount of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> you don't want to be the guy that blocks the entire network. <laughs> <laughs> right? indeed so let's go over to community engagement yes. oh well that's a shitty marketing term so let's not use that um, but before we go over your questions we asked a question on twitter 
And that was one that maybe wasn't really super smart to ask, but it got a ton of engagement. So it was a successful question. And the question was, what device would you like to see Pine64 make? And I don't know, there were like over 80 replies to that. And we each picked five. Mm -hmm. And we are going to going th to go through them now. So, Ezra, what's uh, the position five in your top five? Position five in my top five is a sort of a, an al a, a grouping of multiple questions, but it is people asking for open source for Pine to make an open source GPU with a PCIe okay. connector. Um, oh. I think that that's an intriguing suggestion, but I don't think uh, I would see Pine uh, doing that since there's a lot that goes into a good graphics card. And so unless you want something that's more powerful than like the 30FX chip uh, <laughs> from the <laughs> for the Nintendo Entertainment System, then I'd suggest perhaps... Mm, that they don't i i, yeah. I mean maybe they'd surprise uh they'd surprise us with their talents but i, I can't imagine them making a, a a competitive graphics card it'd be nifty for sure though yeah yeah same here i i really can't imagine that happening there's so much ip or uh, so much intellectual property that's patented that you have to navigate around in this space and just think how long it took Intel to be competitive in the graphics space. I mean, they're about to finally launch some graphics cards, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. So um, and they've been planning that for, I don't know, like 10 years almost. Um, the lead times are, are crazy, and it takes much larger and more funded institutions uh, incredible amounts of time, so I, I don't th see that happening. But now yeah, let's go to my number five, and that is a Pine64 custom chipset. Actually, though, maybe a microcontroller board. So that's an interesting one, and it reminds me of that uh, new Raspberry Pi microcontroller, which, of course, I didn't look up before, so I don't know its name right now. But Maybe that's someone was thinking about there. Uh, that's interesting. Again, making chipsets is quite different business to putting chipsets on a board and uh, selling uh, products made out of that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether we will see uh, Pine64 semiconductors ever. <laughs> <laughs> but who knows? I definitely think that a microcontroller is more of a realistic target mm -hmm. than um, a full GPU, full desktop <laughs> class GPU at that, right? Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Indeed, Pine are, since you mentioned that, they are more of a an assembler. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna create circuits out of um, out of chips and not create the chips themselves. Yeah. With that, unless you had something else to go, no, I can mention my number four. Do that. Which is uh, I, I I've um, put these uh, three together. <laughs> okay. Which is people saying that what they would like is a finished Pine phone. Making a Pine phone that works and that is available, that that would be everyone's dream come <laughs> true. And yeah. a third one asking for a more powerful open source phone. And I th think uh, <laughs> what they're trying to say is that they want uh, a Pine phone that uh, works like a normal phone. But uh, I don't think that that's the issue. I don't think it's it's the hardware. There's a There's a big difference between the hardware and the software. So yeah. with the two first ones that are just saying like, you know, that you should, you know, Pine phone, Pine 64 should make a Pine phone that works. 
<laughs> I think that it's uh, the Pine phone is doing its job just fine, uh, and that we just have to to work on on the software. That's our job as as the community. They never said they'd make an OS. They just would do their best to uh, to to make the the hardware as uh, yeah functional, I guess, <laughs> as they could. And aside from the camera, I think they did a very good job at uh, at at making an affordable little phone. I don't think it's supposed to be powerful uh, either necessarily. It's supposed to be an open source smartphone, and I think that's what it's doing. And as we saw um, every day, it gets better and better as the software improves. So I think understanding the difference between hardware and software when it comes to that. Uh, is important as far as the availability goes. I think everybody's having issues with availability of uh, of various hardwares. I mean, graphics cards in general are out of stock everywhere. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, things can get normal for everyone. But um, the last one that suggests a more powerful open source phone, and a lot of other people who say like, "Oh, I want a Pine Phone version 2.0," it's it's like. Okay, that would be cool too, but I don't know. I feel like it's either going to raise the price or maybe they're going to use a chip that isn't as easy to program for, perhaps. I'm not sure. I think that last one is is, uh, something to think about. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I I agree. I mean, I'm I'm sure uh, we're going to see more linux phones Mm -hmm. in the future i mean i already have a linux phone here that's arguably more powerful than the pine phone with that purism Mm -hmm. librem 5 right Mm -hmm. but uh, whenever you've got a new platform a lot of hardware enablement has to happen again so problems that are solved for the pine phone i mean yeah you said the camera isn't so great but then that chipset, the A64, can only power a 5 megapixel camera. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We need to deal with that camera we have. Mm-hmm. And it works. But then if you check out the Librem 5, well, it has better cameras in theory, but they aren't inv- uh, uh, enabled yet. <laughs> and the same would happen with some future more powerful um, PinePhone 2.0, right? Yeah. So, there's a lot of work that has to be done again for that new hardware. Uh, for the chipset, maybe, to make those camera interfaces work efficiently, then uh, the camera drivers itself and so on. There's really a lot of stuff that always needs to fall into place. And you're right, uh, the community uh, has to work on that. Of course, not everybody, uh, like including me, is a kernel developer and can really mm-hmm. help with that but i think you can we all can help with it by being supportive mm-hmm. and not being uh dicks when something breaks <laughs> and try to be helpful and try to uh, recognize patterns and um, maybe ask or find out how to submit proper bug reports so that we can help the people that are able to do that uh, help them figure it out, right? That's what we all can do and what we should do. 100%. So if something doesn't work, I think this is really important. But with these community projects and these new phones, uh, these new Linux phone pr- platforms in general, not just related to the kernel, but to software in general, uh, try to be kind and helpful and don't yell about it. So... <laughs> That's really something that I would like to ask for generally. <laughs> I agree. And I think that was really well said indeed. Just like our talk with um Dalton. He 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 mentioned that too when we asked uh how we could how, how someone could help for the project if you're not a coder seriously saying finding bug doing proper bug reports and just mentioning properly what's wrong is the first step to fixing it not complaining <laughs> yeah complaining has never fixed anything on its own you know it can i mean it's not totally bad 
to be complaining because otherwise the issue doesn't get caught at all, right? But mm -hmm. try to be constructive. <laughs> so I think I can continue with my number four, right? Yes. Okay, and that's, I picked uh, the Chromecast-like device with Plasma Big Screen. <laughs> so Plasma Big Screen is like the Plasma Mobile of TVs. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so that's definitely an interesting thing. Some little HDMI stick-like device that then runs this. I mean, we can also uh, we kind of have that, right? Mm -hmm. If you take one of the single board computers and uh, put that on the back of your TV and then uh, connect it via HDMI, put Plasma Big Screen on there, that should work, I think. But, yeah. So yeah. that's something I... What do you think about that? <laughs> I think that, that that is a good idea. And if Pine felt like trying to, mm, like, make its actual, like, uh, USB-esque size so that you can just plug it in, or maybe something similar to the Google uh, Chromecast, you know? Yeah. Maybe in a little box and have it pre pre-installed. Although I do like Pine's uh, tinker aspect. If they wanted to, I think it could be fun to have a, a project dedicated just to that. If it doesn't already exist, maybe with um uh H two six four decoder. Yeah. Uh, for MP fours. I don't know if my yeah, open source I mean, exists for that, but I know that uh there is um a decoder codec uh that's used in the rock ship Mm -hmm. Akai 3399 maybe, maybe also the ROCK 64. Mm -hmm. uh, not just the ROCK Pro 64 one, but I don't remember the number. But there's this Hantron thing in there, and that has uh, now some uh, Linux kernel support. Mm -hmm. So I got MP4 decoding. I may, maybe even H265. So the hardware has the capabilities, but Thing is, yeah. Uh, will it ever happen? But I think let's continue with your number three. I think that's a good idea. Um, someone suggests here that he buy three genuinely open, good quality mesh Wi-Fi devices. <laughs> um, I think that's an interesting idea. Uh, once. Once more, and I do like uh, mesh nets where you could just plop a whole bunch of these devices and just create your own sort of internet 2.0. Um, and as long as one of the devices are connected to the internet, all other connected devices would also be connected to the internet. I always wanted to play with something like that. Uh, and I think it would be interesting if he, uh, <laughs> if that existed as well. But, uh, yeah, no, that's all I, I guess I have, <laughs> I have to say is that it's an interesting yeah. idea. I don't know if Pine would do that, but if they do that, there are other people too, I think, asking for like routers yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So they could really go that whole direction if they wanted to. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I think there are some other companies that already ship routers with open WRT based mm -hmm. or open proper open WRT pre-installed so I don't really see the unique selling point here but it's definitely interesting and um, with mesh, mesh Wi-Fi like there are some big name alternatives and I think all those use kind of proprietary uh, standards so depends is there an open standard that we could use and is that viable to use? Because I know there's a specification that has been around forever and that uh, was used in the uh, OLPC, one laptop per child laptops. But I think that one is really hard to implement still. Hmm. So it's... Yeah, but uh, open mesh Wi-Fi routers, that's quite interesting, definitely. My number three is a handheld console with compact flash slot. So these are those old, huge memory cards <laughs> for cards big enough to show art 
logo, etc. Focus on open source games, not pirated ROMs. I don't know. I don't see that this is something that Pine64 is going to do necessarily, but I find it a very charming idea and that's why I picked it. So, you know, the like like those game cartridges like back in the Super uh, Nintendo Entertainment System days or something, that always looked quite nice and you had these uh, cartridges with the imagery on this. So, yeah, that would be fun. But I think that sounds more like something you could build already with 0.64 products and a 3D printer. <laughs> A lot. Uh, it seems like a lot of these suggestions seem like things you could build right now with Pine yeah. products and a 3D printer. Yeah. I guess. I guess. What's wrong? You guys don't want to tinker. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. Well, uh, I also think it's a it's an interesting idea, um, but uh, not Pine's direction. Necessarily, it's too much mm-hmm. uh, a specific niche, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but then of course that thing, if they were to make it, it could also run plasma big screen and have a Chromecast like feature. <laughs> 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 right, you're going to connect that to a TV or big screen anyway. So Amazing. why not? Yeah, <laughs> let's continue with your number two. My number two is. This is interesting. A proper, inexpensive, high reliability, high uptime server. ECC to okay. power inputs for a wide variety of voltages, built in charging circuits for built in UPS to SATA and or M.2 interfaces for redundant storage, large heat sink or heat conducted to the case because moving parts equals bad. <laughs> so um i liked the amount of detail this person put into his idea <laughs> mm. and i also uh he's not alone on um on the people who want pine to make servers and we even talked about it a bit yeah. in the uh, last episode uh i'm not sure why the fascination specifically with servers is is yeah, it or- servers and network or just storage also was in there like mm-hmm. so one with uh, NVMe uh, a network attached storage system and I was like well it's a network attached storage system I get why <laughs> you want SSDs in there because of well noise mm-hmm. and so on but why NVMe honestly your network is not going to be that fast if you've got a gigabit <laughs> network you're not really going to make any use of that extra speed that nvme ssd gives you but yeah whatever Mm -hmm. yeah servers people want servers people want workstations and servers Mm -hmm. and they are supposed to do everything and be affordable (laughs) uh yeah um i think they could be servers they could do everything but then they won't be affordable (laughs) Oh, there could be servers and they could be affordable, but they won't do anything, you know, mm-hmm. that old conundrum. Mm-hmm. You, you got you to gotta choose, you got to choose a side. Yeah, you got to choose two of those three things. <laughs> it's really tough to make that all and then super affordable. Mm-hmm. It's a nice dream, though, for sure. Uh, of course. That's, I guess, the, uh, that's pretty much everything I think I have to say about that. Is that it's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a good idea, but I don't know if it can be executed. So, what's... my number two is something that's really out there. Okay. And that's a printer plus cartridges. Huh. And the person writes on, already had a chat about this, and now it's unreasonable because everything would need to be developed from scratch for years, which the big companies have been perfecting forever. But man, the idea of a printer that works and doesn't just screw you over. <laughs> and I agree. Printers, as they're sold, especially inkjet printers, but laser printers too, are terrible. 
all this digital rights management stuff they include there. I mean, there's a reason why I use for the few pages I have to print a month. I've got some old Apple serial printer based on Canon technology that still works. I mean, I have to use some adapter to use it over USB, but um, there are CUPS drivers for it, so that's my solution to this conundrum. But I would, of course, really like to have a a Pine64 printer, a Print64 maybe. But I also know that that's totally not going to going to happen because yeah distribution think about printer arm a's i mean that's just hell it's really tough to do that aside from the technical challenges what do you think would you like to have a pine 64 printer of course i would love to have a pine 64 printer what kind of question is that (laughs) yeah do you have a printer actually I don't actually think I have any kind of printer. <laughs> so really any printer would do would do me great right now, right about now. I think I have one yeah. broken one. Yeah, my printer is from nineteen ninety five and it still works. Yeah. Built to really last. gotta go back to those very old printers and see if they can still be somewhat run with Linux. Mm-hmm. Uh and then you've got something. I need to refine my printer setup so that I can finally uh print over the network because currently it's like uh, I've got this one laptop that I managed to get cups set up properly for that old printer and I have to boot that thing whenever I have to print something but that's you know it's good to boot some hardware twice a month right (laughs) (laughs) it's slightly inconvenient (laughs) isn't that everyone's problem yeah slight inconvenience oh yeah so what's your favorite one my favorite one as suggested by you guys was someone who would like to see a voice assistant a um a kind of uh uh google home alexa kind of kind of deal um he says that he likes the idea of a voice assistant a lot. He think it'd be funny or uh, fun to integrate with Stanford Oval, uh, okay, Almond, and My Replica, which uh, is an AI thing. What that is? Okay. <laughs> it, it basically, uh, Replica can replicate somebody's uh, speech patterns, or in this case, texting patterns, so that when you text Replica. It feels like you're texting the person that's supposed to replicate. Um, yeah, I don't know if if Replica is um, is open source, uh, but I assume so if he's talking about it. But I don't know. I'd have to look at that. But uh, I do know that he also says that it, all in all, that'd be good for educational uh, opportunities. Uh, I suppose that's true. Um, once more, not an idea that can't be uh, done with existing hardware to just put on something like Minecraft, yeah, and uh, and put it in a in a case, add a microphone, set everything up, and you got yourself a voice assistant. Um, which once more is more a software issue than a hardware issue. But that said, uh, a perhaps uh, something that that's more specifically designed with the assistant in mind, something maybe with like a screen, a speaker, and a microphone all pre-assembled, oh. could be yeah, you know could be interesting. Let's say people um, have bought this device that I've made f- many videos about, and they are not happy with it as a phone. Maybe they could repurpose it to use it <laughs> as a assistant i mean it's yeah the pine phone is not perfect for the purpose you likely would like to have um more directional microphones or a louder speaker maybe Mm -hmm. but you could connect those Mm -hmm. and you're done yeah and you uh, plasma mobile has this uh mycroft gui already so which doesn't work unless you connect it to another device running Minecraft or you install Minecraft on the Pine phone, but yeah. Um, so, yeah, 
the sky's the limit, I would yeah, say. Right? For sure, for sure. Yeah. He does also mention, uh, among other things, um, an eGPU, uh, which I don't have anything okay. to add because we already talked about open source yeah. GPUs. But uh, the fact that he mentioned that a, an external graphics card was, uh, I guess, interesting to consider separately because it's not necessarily, I guess, PCIe. Yeah, but then it's PCIe over uh, Thunderbolt usually. Yeah. So that's PCIe with a different connector. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's completely actual, different. I mean, <laughs> not, 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 not quite, but somewhat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my my number one is the e ink like note taker. I mean, obviously, obviously, it is. I uh, talked about this multiple times, even in this relatively young podcast. So yeah, there's not much to say about it, right? I just want that. It's a great idea. Thing. Software is really a, the challenge there because you want to have this seamless. So that it doesn't bother you too much, but also it should keep the notes organized and so on. So, yeah, something like uh, Xonal Plus Plus isn't just going to cut it, most likely, but might be for a stopgap solution. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I'm curious to see uh, what's going to happen there in the Quartz 64 space. Oh, for sure. That, that's that's going to be really fun, I think. It's going to be really <laughs> interesting. I um yeah, I don't think I have anything to add to that, although I do have uh my own suggestion. Oh uh which would be not that I think that they'd necessarily do it, but I wanna see an open source virtual reality alternate reality headset. Uh okay. And specifically something that could be some kind of FOSS alternative to the Oculus Quest. Yeah. And it would oh, it force Pine to look at higher graphic fidelity solutions since you'd have to render, uh, well, graphics. <laughs> okay. Uh, but otherwise, uh, it, all it would be is a computer in a headset with a gyroscope and some amount of graphic capabilities. You get the right amount of lens, you get a high resolution screen, and you're done. Easy. I could do it. But I'm not going to do <laughs> <Okay>. it. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I would, but you know, I just uh, you know, I don't have the time, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, right. I think I, I think it could be a very um an interesting idea to have have that and once again I, I, software development for that would actually be um i think interesting too because uh the oculus quest has like this whole um home environment that when you put it on and you can like decorate it and you can launch different applications from that and i think that could be fun to program uh in my opinion for me <laughs> anyway <laughs> yeah and it it doesn't have to be just for games it could be for for various like uh just any virtual interactive thing, you know, perhaps modeling or, or I don't know, lear- learning. It's yeah, stuff like that. You know, uh, just just an open source alternative to that. that. That's my idea. That's what I got to put on the table. Uh, what that do you would think? Be quite ambitious. That would be quite ambitious. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've got one more bonus thing. Oh, well, it's not really a bonus. It's uh, um, because. Well, I've for these comments recently, and uh, of course it happened here too, and that was, well, I like what Pine64 is making now, but everything is out of stock. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and Lucas replied to that, that they are working on it, and that most devices and sus- uh, single board computers will be back in stock this month. So, mm. yeah, second half of March, March something like that. Uh, but also, uh, there's this really tough silicon shortage so don't expect fully stocked everything for throughout the year i think is the summary of that 
just to mention that, right? Hooray. Because I know many people are waiting to order their Pine Phone or Pine Book or what, whatever you name it, right? Mm-hmm. And can't currently, so that's good news for you. This will okay. be your chance. <laughs> your chance, yeah. And now let's get to your questions. And first, let's start about some shorter follow up ones because, well, they have to do with what, what we talked about previously. Or what in, well, in case of the first one, something we didn't really talk about previously. And the question is Will you guys ever talk about the pine time? <laughs> And yeah, I kind of answered that on Discord already. But uh, the thing is, we will talk about it. But I think we really need to have it and have played with it to talk about it in some kind of an informed way, right? Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that as well? One hundred percent. We can't. I mean, we can't say anything I mean, about it if we don't even really yeah. know. I mean, yeah, we can look, we can look about videos just like you could look at, at videos or read articles about it, but we need experience. We could say like, oh, it looks smooth, but I don't like that <laughs> font. But uh, <laughs> otherwise, yeah. And, you know, that we, we could talk about the ships in there, but then it's such an embedded uh, system on a chip in there uh, or I don't know even if you call those systems on a chip still in this tiny things, or if that's another different name. But yeah, uh, so and that we, doesn't really make sense to talk about the megahertz of that CPU, right? So we will talk about it. Uh, there are parcels on our way as we speak, uh, but they haven't arrived yet. So stay tuned for that. And another question around the same line uh, is. Just listened to the intro and was wondering if you're going to talk about the Pinebook Pro and various operating systems such as Twisters is, I don't know, Twister OS maybe? Perhaps. <laughs> yeah, um, same here. <laughs> we don't have the hardware, so... <laughs> I mean, we could talk about stuff, but it's... That would be like uh, having a parrot here. Um, mm -hmm. But I think Maybe if you've got a decent microphone and experience with these devices, get in touch uh, and we could talk to you. Like, we talk to Dalton. Mm -hmm. Like in some kind of an interview. You should have time on Tuesdays for that. <laughs> because that's when we are usually recording. But yeah, just uh, write us a mail, contact us on Twitter or Mastodon. And yeah. Speaking of microphones, here's another wild idea. Get your voice on this podcast. What do you think, Ezra? Um, Should man, we do that? I think it'd be an interesting idea. I know I always wanted to be on this podcast. Yeah. You know, just uh, record your question and send the file to us. And then we can make it appear like you're here with us. It's like magic. So, yeah. And now the... Actual follow-up questions. I don't know why I call the second follow-up questions. I'm, I think I was a little bit stupid there. But uh, the question was, has the RISC-V single-board computer an open-source GPU? Well, we know its name now, right? Don't we? It's Pine1. Yes. Woohoo. That could be great. Yeah. We also know that it only has a 2D GPU, so no 3D at all. And I really tried to research that, and according to CNX software, the 2D accelerator is similar to what is used in the all-winner V3S, which is an ARM system on a chip for action cameras. Um, I couldn't find a name, and therefore couldn't find out whether it has drivers. <laughs> uh, it's definitely unlikely to be open-source hardware. Mm -hmm. but it might have an open source driver if not no uh, it may have one eventually mm -hmm. uh, so yeah we don't know sadly but we will find out soon enough and I think it, it, you, it, you will get some kind of an image on the screen 
if you connect the screen to that yeah, well, pretty I, soon. I would hope so, anyway. <laughs> yeah. And then we have another question, which is related. And that's a longer one, and that was Bud. And Bud asks, would it be practical for Pine64 to make a false GPU for the desktop? <laughs> or hide a power GPU for your next laptop? You guys want a GPU so bad. Yeah, another GPU guy. Ah, <laughs> what do we have to say to this? Well, I think we already said most of it. <laughs> I think so. I mean, I pre-wrote an answer here, but yeah, I, it's complicated to make these things. I don't see that happening. Um future laptops so that would be like next generation pinebook pro or something well that's going to likely going to have a new system on a chip because otherwise it wouldn't be called a new generation and uh, that also is then very likely to have a more powerful gpu and hopefully one that uh, also has great driver support from the start right uh, because, well, you can have all the powerful hardware if you don't have the great open source drivers mm -hmm. or great Linux drivers. Mm, yeah. That doesn't help you much. Um, I don't see, uh, something like a dedicated GPU in such a laptop. What do you think about that? Uh, same. I, I, I don't, I mean, yeah, they can't, they, uh, they're, if if there's gonna be a higher power GPU, it's gonna be like one that already exists. You know? Perhaps some lower end uh, AMD graphics card, uh, specifically yeah. for mobile. Uh, you could fit that in there, and that could be a pretty good uh, midway. And I think could be maybe a good idea at some degree to have um like not not a too high end but it could still be cheap and it could still or like inexpensive it could be some low end pre-existing gpu that already has open source drivers in the linux kernel mm. it could be fun could be could be good to have i guess okay like like uh in a modular laptop and then there's a module optional gpu model where yeah you can put some amd card in pretty much in a laptop form factor well yeah Problem is, there's not much standardization in the <laughs> laptop space, unfortunately. But that's something that would be great. I would really appreciate that mm -hmm. uh, if it were to happen. And generally, having a separate GPU increases the cost a lot, makes the design of a de device more complicated. That's yeah. why these systems on a chip are so successful. Yeah. Uh, because you don't need all these many uh, layers uh, on your board, for your board, and can make the overall design a lot simpler the more is in that one chip. That's true. So, yeah, that would, wouldn't be a cheap laptop then if it has a dedicated GPU. <laughs> Even if it's a rather low-end one, I think. Yeah, I guess. I guess so. I, I didn't consider the, uh, you know, the fact that you'd have to connect everything together. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's always uh, the thing. It's really complicated when <laughs> you get into it and think like okay so let's do this and then you do so oh, we can't use the four layer pcb now we need to uh go with six or even eight layers or something i don't mm -hmm. i'm just talking mm -hmm. numbers uh Connect without the knowing frame. them really but yeah uh regarding force gpu there is an effort and we've linked a story here. Uh, it, that would be an open source GPU built on Risk Five. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is, if you go to the source of that story, then uh, it's kind of funny because they say that's uh, Libra-soc.org that a 3D dedicated 3D GPU is not their main scope because they are trying to build a system on a chip. That is a hybrid of CPU, so central processing unit, video processing unit, VPU, and graphics processing unit, GPU. That's another interesting project. Uh, maybe check that out. Uh, I've seen some doubts of whether that would go anywhere, but maybe it is, and 
well, maybe there will be eventually Pine64 products with that. I mm -hmm. can't rule it out, right? Yeah, no, I don't sure. think think it's really likely, at least in the near term, because they are going to take some time to get their designs finished. But, yeah. Speaking of time, <laughs> I think we are uh, nearing the end of this episode. Mm -hmm. So, thank you for listening. Um, the podcast is now listed in one more directory. Uh, there's one yet that we are supposed to list it on, but uh, I have a hard time with figuring out how to add stuff to gpodder, which is why we can't report full success yet. Mm. Also, if you are using the mp3 feed, check out the chapter markers. These can be handy if you vaguely remember something we have been talking about or well, and you want to find it again. Or if you find a segment really boring, you can just skip to the next segment. And if you don't need those chapter markers, save some bandwidth and use my beloved Opos version. <laughs> Subscribe to that feed. Once more, a huge thanks to NerdZoom Media for being our audio producers. Thank you for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Remember, this is a community podcast, so please leave feedback on what we should do better. Get your suggestions in and feel free, feel free to ask questions. You can join the Discord channel, Pine Talk Podcast, on Pine64's Discord. You can send us an email at pinetalk at pine64.org and tweet at us. We're at TalkPine. We've joined Mastodon recently. We're at TalkPine at Fostodon.org. If you can't remember these names, just use the hashtag, hashtag AskPineTalk. Yeah, thanks for listening, and goodbye. Bye-bye.